Okay. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming. Welcome to the second year of our critical conversations about diversity and justice series. I'm Ann Fibbs, Director of Education in the Office for Equity and Diversity. Before I introduce our moderator, I'd like to remind you that information about this year's series can be found on the Office for Equity and Diversity's website, uh, www.equity.diversity.umn. Did I get that right, Jody? .umn.edu. <laughs> Okay, mistake number one. Let's <laughs> cross your fingers. And that there are posters and flyers when you're coming in. Please help us spread the word about this important series. Um, this year, we're excited to say that we are live streaming via our website, uh, the Office for Equity and Diversity's website, for each conversation. If you are here in the audience, we won't actually be capturing you on video, though you do look fabulous, I just want to say. Um, we will be capturing our wonderful... Uh, panelists and moderator on video, uh, but we will be capturing your comments and questions on audio, so we will be asking you to speak into the microphone. Um, and all of our conversations will be um, archived on our website. Critical Conversations About Diversity and Justice is a collaboration between the University Libraries and the Office for Equity and Diversity. A big thanks to diversity librarian Jody Gray, not just for saving me just now, but also for creating a bibliography of related materials, which you can access on our website. And I would also like to thank Claire Walter Marchetti. She's not able to be here today, but she's been absolutely instrumental in setting up all of these series, both last year and this year. So as we start this year's series, we want to focus right here on this institution in the academy and ask how can we help a centuries-old institution create a new culture. We are very fortunate that we have um, a phenomenal moderator who's here to help us navigate this topic, Professor Carol Chomsky. She has been teaching commercial law, statutory interpretation, and American legal history here at the University of Minnesota since 1985. Carol helped create and continues to help lead the Structured Study Group Program at the law school, an academic support program for first-year law students. She currently serves as Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the law school, and her research has included work on the U.S.-Dakota War Trials and the History of Women Lawyers. Carol is past director of the University of Minnesota Early Career Program on Excellence and Diversity in Teaching and past co-director of the Multicultural Teaching and Learning Fellows Program for the Center for Teaching and Learning. She's also past president of the Minnesota Lawyers Association. And if I kept going from a resume, we wouldn't get very far with our conversation. So I'm going to stop there and ask you to welcome Carol Chomsky. Thanks, Anne. W one small correction. It, I was co I was president of Minnesota Women Lawyers, not the Minnesota Lawyers Association. I don't want to claim more than I have. <laughs> That's okay. It's close enough, but it's well, and it's significant that it was the women lawyers. Um, so I want to um, add to Anne's welcome. Welcome you to the first of this year's critical conversations about diversity and justice, sponsored as you know by the University of Minnesota's Office for Equity and Diversity, and co-sponsored by the University Libraries. The series began last year, and the range of topics that was covered last year demonstrates the breadth of the OED vision. And I thought it was worth just mentioning what those topics were, because it is an extraordinary range of topics, even just last year, and then we add this year's as well. Um, so same-sex marriage and GLBT equality, the Occupy movement and issues of class and public policy, the role of religion in politics and public life, society's struggle with invisible disabilities, and the university's struggle with invisible disabilities. Racism in a post-racial America. For anybody listening and not watching, there were scare quotes around post-racial. <laughs> um, conversations about feminism across generations of women and stories about migration and globalization. This year, the topics are equally broad and challenging, leaving aside today's topic. Gender identity, questioning the culture of science, important issues in the deaf community, racism and American Indian issues, reconstructing masculinity, and international diversity. It's a truly amazing range of topics. And it's an unusual kind of program as well. Um, some of you may have been at some of the programs last year, or you may have been just drawn to this conversation this year. But they really are more of a conversation than the typical program. We have a set of panelists, but even the remarks um, tend to be, they are, 
more um, uh, conversational, um, uh, talking about what comes to their minds with respect to the topic and based on their experience, they're often more personal conversations as well from the panel because they're drawing on their experience either in the academy or elsewhere. And, um, and a more, uh, more of a conversation with the audience as well. So after about 30 minutes, we're going to turn to you and ask for comments, questions, um, to join the conversation that the panel um, begins. So today, as um, Anne has said, we turn our attention inward to explore issues of diversity and justice in our own house, in the academy. I, I'm going to ask some uh, framing questions, sort of ideas about the kinds of things that might be part of this conversation. But these are starting points and pretty broad questions. Um, but just to give a sense of the kinds of things at least I was thinking of as I thought about the topic, as I agreed to moderate, as I had some conversation with the panelists and what they um, want to talk about. So how do issues of race, class, gender, disability, and status impact us directly in our work and in our work relationships? How does campus structure and culture affect students, faculty, and staff interaction, satisfaction, and success? That you might recognize I took from the title of the pro from the description of the program, so I didn't make all of these up. Um, how can we bring our commitments to diversity and justice to bear here in our work together? Have we created a culture of inclusion? Where have we succeeded and how could we do better? I'm just asking the questions. We have a terrific set of panelists to begin to answer those, uh, but maybe to ask more questions as well. Um, the nature of these conversations as well typically raises issues, um, identifies concerns, maybe provides some ideas and, and but we're answers, but we're not in the business of answering all these questions definitively by any means. I'm going to introduce the panelists one at a time, um, give you a little bit of information about their background, um, I expect that they will each tell you a little bit more um, because they will be drawn from their experience at the university and elsewhere, so they will talk more about, more specifically about the nature of what their experience has been. Um, and I'm going to um, ask, uh, ask each of them in a slightly specific way, but really the, 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 bottom, the bottom line question for each of them is to talk about their own experiences at the university with respect to inclusion or exclusion and to explain what is particularly important for us, what they think is particularly important for us to consider, or what they think of as particularly important for themselves as we think about diversity and justice at the university. As I said, I'll target my questions for each a little bit, but it is a jumping off point, and I have given them license, and I expect they may or may not answer the question I ask. Um, they're going to talk about what's important to them in relationship to this issue. That's the nature of conversation. So. Let's begin. I'll introduce the first of our uh, panelists. It was uh, almost a random order. I shuffled my papers and sort of the way it came out. So, um, Ferd Schlapper is our first speaker. He's Director and Chief Health Officer at Boynton Health Service. Before joining the University of Minnesota, he played leadership roles in the health field at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and Boise State University and was Vice President for Academic Health Solutions I don't know what that means, but that was the title, <laughs> at Cigna Health, a global health insurance and health service company. As a leader in college health for 27 years, he has helped to focus attention on a more comprehensive view of what it means to create a healthy campus community, nurturing cultural and human differences and supporting development of an environment that supports faculty and staff at work and enhances student academic and developmental success. Among the firsts accomplished under his leadership are the first state agency to offer domestic partner benefits in Wisconsin and Idaho, the first public four-year institution of higher education to propose, propose converting to a smoke-free campus at Boise State, and the first university to contract with the Veterans Administration to offer on-campus services for returning student veterans. So um, I will turn to you and ask, just again slightly targeted, what does it take to transform the living, learning, and working environment at the university to support the success of faculty, staff, and students to make the university a healthy place for all of us? And you're, I know you want to talk about what, what healthy means um, and how do those needs connect to issues of diversity and justice. Thank you, Carol. Um, I could talk for probably the hour and a half on this and get rolling, and so I will try and keep this very focused. 
um, there's so much that we're doing to create this healthy, vibrant campus community so that our students can thrive and reach their full potential. Our faculty and staff are engaged and satisfied in their work. This is, this is a destination of choice for learning and living and doing work, research, service, and so forth. And what does that mean? How do we create that environment? That's what I found so exciting with college health in that if we're just a facility that's a clinical services health care treatment of minor illness and injury, we're really not serving the purpose of the mission of the university. We could go across the street and tap into community resources. It's really more about this issue of how do we create this vibrant campus community to support the work that we're all doing. And in the absence of that, we really can't reach our full potential. It is a critical conversation. I think it's also critical timing. We're looking at uh, strategic planning and, and the President's uh, committee right now to look at this. What is our vision for this University of Minnesota? It's a critical timing as far as the challenges that higher education face. Are we really delivering on the promise of higher education right now? The value that we um, propose, are our students reaching their full potential in, in turning out tomorrow's global leaders and our policy makers and decision makers? Is it really just a piece of paper, let's get them through for four years, they've got the degree and then head out, or is it really much more than that? And so how do we create this vibrant community? We want our students to be engaged in the campus community. They find out very quickly whether, in fact, we are a community or not. And so how do we develop that? Uh, it's a lot of our focus working with partners, relationship building across the campus. And one of the things that we're doing, Boynton is a fairly large uh, organization on the campus, Boynton Health Service, uh, a little over, I think, 1% of the entire university budget, close to 300 employees. And one of the things I brought uh, with me to the organization and our diverse internal group is that we can't create this healthy campus community and, and support our students, our faculty, and staff if we're not a healthy organization internally also. And so how do we create that, model that as a foundation from which we can provide those best services? And I've had others talk to me about that and looking at is this something that we can spread further to Office of Student Affairs and other departments of what it means to be a healthy organization internally so that we can do our best work. And that's been a, a, a critical focus for me um, coming in. I could frame that quickly a little bit as an overview. Um, to set that table, we really, I walk around with the staff and say, as, as the director of Boynton Health Service, I'm really here to support each of you. I report to my staff, in a sense, rather than them reporting to me. I'm here to help them be successful every day what having that conversation with each of our staff members what is it that enables you to do your best work every day do you feel you can be successful how can i help address those issues that are those barriers and obstacles so that you do are, are feeling able to do your best work and have the conversation with them that they feel valued respected supported their voice matters in the discussions um, creating a safe environment for that discussion is critical, people feeling like, is, is this something that I can speak up and talk about? And so how do we do that uh, to create that safe environment, the no titles, no power differential? It's all of us working together, recognizing what's the value of our work, the purpose of why we're here, our worthwhile work, tapping into the passion of why people got into the field in the first place, and working together to better outcomes and solutions. The things that are... Um, the challenges that everyone agrees what needs to be done are the low-hanging fruit. We probably tackled all of those already. And so most other issues are complex, have different options, uh, pros and cons, different perspectives. And so we have to feel comfortable to engage in that debate and discussion to get to the best solutions as a team so that people feel committed to that, that we we're able to really put this all on the table in a respectful way so that I know what we're doing and why and can support that. And then as a team, we set our expectations of what we want to accomplish and we hold each other accountable to that because we're all engaged in this process and feel that this has been valuable to us. So that's been a foundation of, of my work with the group. Uh, it's a continual process. We're reading books, we're doing trainings, we're dedicating time to this. If this is important, how do we carve out time to do that work together? Um, 
staff will say we don't have time for this because we're so busy but if we don't make time we're not productive in the work that we're doing we're inefficient we're dysfunctional uh, we're not accomplishing the best that we can in reaching that full potential so it's that's really been a core of our work um, it's building on individual strengths we're, we're involved we're one of the departments doing the strengths finder along with students and I know others are looking at that also that everyone is an individual and we're tapping into your individual perspectives and strengths and expertise uh, rather than just this is the way we'll treat everyone this is my style everyone has to get used to the leader versus how do I connect with everyone else to make sure we're meeting your needs and and your diverse uh, interests and so forth um, and then again recognizing what what's our ultimate outcome how do we identify and define success how do we measure that how do we demonstrate that in fact this is leading to those outcomes as as a team and so that's what we're looking at working on internally um, and, and including everyone in that process that they feel valued and part of it so that we can reach out then and do this across the campus and support uh, all of our colleagues. Um, as we reach out, just very quickly, probably the most critical issue we're addressing is around mental health issues. Um, as self-identified by students and others, four of the top five issues that get in the way of them being successful are mental health related. And if they're not struggling with a mental health issue, they know someone, a friend, a colleague, a roommate, a boyfriend who is, and they're not sure what to do about it. So uh, trying to address those issues, it's a great bridge builder between health services, student affairs, and academic affairs because faculty are in the front lines in the classroom seeing this play out with students of concerning behavior, in distress, what does this mean, what do I do about this? What are the warning signs? How do we get connected with supportive resources? How do we follow up on that? So it's a great connector there. It permeates all our lives um, in student services for the faculty. When a student is sitting down in financial aid office, academic advisor, there's underlying stressors and issues that, that we're working on addressing. The, the tragedies that we see in the headlines, and again now the Naval Yard this week, almost always it's underlying mental health issues. So are we creating support systems uh, society is wrestling with this again with the strategic planning what a great opportunity for the University of Minnesota to say here's what we're doing as a community and working together to address these issues together building on the strengths that we all bring to this to make sure we're creating a vibrant environment for people to reach their full potential and do their best work so that's what excites me critical topic critical timing. thanks we could of course had an ongoing conversation just with the one, but um, but I'm gonna we're gonna progress down the panel and then and then open it for broader conversation um, when everybody's had a chance. So our, our next speaker is Lola Mohammed Noor. She's a 2012 graduate of the University of Minnesota in political science and journalism with a minor in African American and African studies. As a senior, she received the Hattie Steinberg Scholarship and the Josie Johnson Human Rights and Social Justice Award recognizing her community engagement work. After graduation, she worked as a communications associate for the Office for Equity and Diversity and is currently a community engagement editor for the Twin Cities Daily Planet, an online community news website doing outreach to communities of color and immigrant communities. She has used and continues to use journalism as a tool to educate others about diversity and issues affecting students of color. Um, her experience at the university, well, it was t twofold as a student and then and then working um, for the Office for Equity and Diversity. But but a, a primary um, thing she brings to this panel is her experience as a student here um, and a quite recent graduate. So I have asked her to talk about the student experience at the University um, of, of Minnesota with respect to inclusion and exclusion the difficulties faced by students of color in particular at the university and what helped support you and other students to succeed and maybe what barriers we put in the way of that success. Thank you. Is this on by the way? Can you hear me? Okay, great. <laughs> all right, so um, yeah, so first of all, thanks to OED for inviting me. It's, you know, great to be back at the U of M and, um, you know, I'm usually around but have kind of distanced myself this past year, so it's nice to just be back in a different capacity. Um, so I guess, 
Yeah, there are a couple of things that I'd like to talk about today. Um, mainly, I was asked to talk about my experience as a student of color when I was a student here, and um, my experience in organizing with the Who's University campaign, which was a student-led campaign. So um, I will talk about all of those things. But I think for me, what it comes down to when I think about you know transforming this campus or institutions in general um, to to be more um, you know to to kind of reach the goals of social justice and you know diversity and equity for me it comes down to safe spaces and being intentional about inclusion and being intentional about um, creating safe and brave spaces um, for you know different narratives and embracing you know people's narratives and world views that may be different from your own but being intentional about you know this is a space that I'm going to create as an instructor as a professor as a staff member whatever um, to allow you to bring your whole self to the table there are many times when uh, when I was a student of color when I felt like I did have that you know when I did have mentors or professors who did create that kind of space for me you know like the multicultural center for academic excellence is just like the first example that comes to mind um, but there were also a lot of times when that wasn't the case you know um, when you know there are times when you feel like you know as a, as a woman of color as a Muslim woman um, you know as, as a first generation student being of immigrant background all of these things um, where you feel like you have to censor yourself in the classroom because your social location or where you're coming at is so vastly different from the others in the room that you know you're afraid that if you say something like different you're gonna be othered or you know you're gonna be seen as like you know just just different and I mean I can give you some examples um, overall I mean I, I've had a wonderful experience in both of my majors and my minor but you know I can think of for example in political science major when I had a class and um, you know the the lecture was looking at um, we were looking at economic inequalities and we had a reading that we were assigned and so we had a class conversation about the book and um, you know the the professor was trying to get us to have more of a critical discussion and to me, as I was reading the book the night before, like what jumped out at me was, wow, this is a really racist book. You know, like that was the first thing that jumped out at me. Um, and I was just sitting in the classroom. It was like a lecture, a hall of about 80 students, I think. And, you know, mostly white students. And I'm sitting there kind of waiting to see, is anybody going to bring up the R word? And pretty much nobody does. So, you know, that's the point where you're kind of like going back and forth do I bring it up you know am I gonna be that student of color that's always talking about race in the classroom um, or not am I not gonna put myself out there and if I don't put myself out there that conversation is not gonna be had but if I do put myself out there that's a very vulnerable place to put myself in and so I ended up I, I said something you know and you know I said and I said you know personally I felt like this book was an offensive read to me as someone of African descent I felt like it portrayed Africans in a very negative light and you know I kind of gave reasons as to why and I could sense like in the classroom just this weird awkward silence <laughs> you know and um, from then on I think during the semester other students were really careful around me you know like careful not to you know get on her bad side or you know oh she's gonna point out that I'm a racist you know what I mean and so it's kind of like um, kind of just navigating that I think I think students of color on this campus um, really do have to navigate that all the time and it's just the nature of you know what it is as a majority white institution um, and um, I guess I can now talk a little bit about who's you if I have enough do I have enough time okay let me know I talk a lot <laughs> could go on and on like you said I could spend an hour and a half talking about all of these things so the Who's University campaign was started in 2011 um, and not by myself actually it was started by Hannah Werko and Sophia Shank who are also alum of the U of M two really trailblazing women uh, very amazing activists and social justice leaders in the community um, who are both not not in, in town anymore but um, they're kind of uh, my understanding of why Who's University was started was to question um, this institution's commitment to diversity. You know, we all like to throw that word around. Um, but c question its commitment to diversity within the context of the experiences of students of color, first generation students, and low income students. So it's pretty broad in that sense. And uh, we were looking at three sites um, those were admissions and retention rates. 
of, of these students, so primarily students of color. Um, we were also looking at cultural centers because there was a controversy at the time, and I can kind of get into that later. Um, but, you know, the kind of the value that is placed on cultural centers and student groups for students of color and ethnic studies departments, as well as, you know, women's studies, um, gender, women's sexuality studies, and so non-traditional um, studies departments. And... Um, the Who's University campaign was really beautiful because it was entirely student-led, and um, it was it was really grassroots, and it was a multimedia campaign. So we were using things like Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, and blogging to kind of change the narrative about what it means to be a student at the U of M. Um, you know, if you walk in Kaufman, for example, and you see a lot of the pictures in the building, it's usually old white men or young white men. You know what I mean? And that doesn't really relate to us as students of color. And um, I'm just keeping it really, like, like, I'm not being PC. You know, I was asked to speak, so I'm, I'm just speaking my truth. <laughs> and um, the beautiful thing about Who's You was, you know, we were saying, no, like, it's time to change the narrative. Like, the U of M you know, has a very uh, contested history of you know, exploitation and exclusion, and we're not talking about it. And what, we, what we're choosing to display are, you know, these images of, you know, of, you know, we're all good, everything's good, but the thing is, it's not, you know. Um, and the, the main premise as well of the campaign or the movement was um, looking at kind of questioning what does it mean to be a public land grant institution, and are you, are you committed to that, you know. Are you committed to that on paper, on paper, yes, but how does that manifest itself in reality? Um, so really complicated questions. And um, we were in conversations that year. I think that was my junior year. And I remember we were, you know, organizing, um, just organizing people, bringing people together, students, staff, and faculty at the U, as well as different high schools in the metro area. Um, and we were also trying to expand the conversation to look at community colleges and K through 12 as well, so looking at the education gap. And um, what, we, what it kind of all culminated into was a final kind of day of education public event in April of um, 2011. And it was this huge, like, day-long event. We had workshops, presentations, spoken word performances, you know, artistic presentations. And it was, I mean, I, I don't know if, if you were there, Anne, but it was just a beautiful event, just bringing the community together and really tackling these these serious issues, you know, questions of racial inclusion and exclusion and what does it mean to be a first-generation student at at this institution? What does it mean to be, you know, I remember one student at the time was in the, um, she was majoring in art, and her kind of art was highlighting, you know, issues of women of color and what it means to be a woman of color in the art department. She was dealing with a lot of struggles. So what, what are those struggles, you know? And... Um, I think the best thing that came out of that was um, I think we we really brought attention to a lot of these issues. And I remember, you know, meeting with OED staff too that year and feeling like, you know, we're we're being heard. And so I think there still is definitely a lot of work to be done. Um, I haven't kept up with what's going on with ethnic studies, although I know it's constantly you know, a question that's up there, are the ethnic studies departments going to be consolidated into one smaller department or not? You know, so um, these are definitely questions that are always um, ongoing. But I think for us, Who's You was a very, um, it was, it impacted me because it, it, it was kind of us taking agency as students and saying, we're not going to wait for you to create this space for us. We are going to do it ourselves. And so... Um, you know, looking back, I think it it would have been nice if, um, you know, more, I guess if more departments and more professors would, would be more intentional about creating those kinds of spaces and working with students who are interested in doing that. So I think that's what I have for now. I talked a lot. I'll stop there. <laughs> no, it was perfect, perfect time. <laughs> um, thank you, Lola. So our next speaker is Shireen Horzak who is Executive Office and Administrative Specialist at the Humphrey School of Public Affairs and President of AFSCME 3800, the Clerical Workers Union at the University. She's worked at the Humphrey School Dean's Office since 2004, coordinating policy issues and faculty hiring, promotion, and tenure. 
prior to working at the Humphrey School, Shireen was the national director of so CISPES, I don't know how to pronounce the acronym, the Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador, a human rights and social justice organization based in New York City. In that capacity, she coordinated numerous election observer missions of several hundred people each, organized a successful international campaign to stop the privatization of the Salvadoran public health care system, and coordinated a multi-country coalition against the Central America Free Trade Agreement. She also served on the National Steering Committee for Stonewall 25, the march commemorating the historic Stonewall Rebellion that started the modern United States GLBT rights movement. She has a long history of activism, as you can see, including as an undergrad at the U a long time ago, now I have to say those were her words, <laughs> working to keep the administration from shutting down the sexual violence program, now the Aurora Center, including by organizing a student occupation at President Hasselmo's office. <laughs> So, um, Shireen, we, we usually think about inclusiveness and division with respect to categories like race, gender, sexual orientation, and class, but status, job classification, and role, particularly at the university, is also clearly an issue. And if you can talk from your experience about how the issues of justice, diversity, and inclusion play out with respect to the staff experience at the university, although clearly you also have a broader societal perspective to bring us as well. Sure, um, and thanks uh, for the opportunity to be here today. I'm, I'm happy to be here today and sad that I didn't make um, any of the conversations last year. They all looked really and sounded really fascinating, and I'm hoping that I'll be able to make the ones um, in the future. And I wanted to talk, uh, touch on a couple of issues about um, class and status at the university, but also look at issues of race and gender and how, how they all uh, relate to each other. And I think it's important that we have to analyze it both on an individual versus uh, systemic level and at the university thinking about it in terms of departmental versus, versus administrative levels too. Because I think that, that um, this is one university, but it's very different from workplace to workplace. And the reality that that we have as, as a workforce here can vary tremendously based on what role you play at any given time in a department and you can be here for 25 years, change, um, have the same job in three different departments and have three really different experiences. And I think that holds true for students as well. Um, and faculty, I think, have more of a tendency to stay within the department because they're in a particular field. But I think for staff and students, we move around a lot more. Um, and I want to think about, ask people to think about the challenges and common interests that we have um, in building, uh, building a vision of social justice at the university. Um, so thinking about it on a systemic level, um, as, a, as a staff person who, I was a, a grew up in rural Minnesota, came to the university um, as the first person in my family to go to college and did very well in school and then hit the university and was absolutely overwhelmed and alienated from everything. I just felt like I did not connect at all. Um, and it was a really hard experience as a student and it was, that was actually what got me into activism because I found a home that was there and I found that there was actually a group of people who talked about class. Um, and for the first time I felt like growing up working class, I heard from people who said that wasn't a bad thing. Where when I first started at the university, I felt like there was no space for that discussion. So that's how I actually got into activism. Um, my, I come from a long line of trade union activists, actually. Um, and so, so thinking about class was something that, that uh, I saw as very important. But when you get to the university, there isn't a discussion about it. And I think in society, in the U.S. as a whole, there's not a discussion about class. Um, but the class permeates every aspect of our lives, I think, in a lot of ways. And you see how race and gender, um, ability, disability play into it, especially thinking about health care issues and who can afford health care and who can't. And that's something that comes up a lot. I think at the university there's um, a, a challenge that I see as, as a clerical worker who held a position where I had a title and had a job where I was directing people and relating to things on an international level and felt very confident in my job to suddenly come to the university. And what mattered was whether or not I had a degree um, and the title that I had at the university. And suddenly as a clerical worker, I was viewed as support staff, um, 
and disregarded and disrespected in a lot of ways. And I don't mean by the people I worked with directly. I, I actually really enjoy working at the Humphrey School, but I think that it, um, as a university as a whole, and if you talk to clerical staff, if you talk to people who work in food service, building maintenance, um, grounds crew, there's a real similarity there for support staff where we're invisible in some ways and we're viewed as um, uneducated, um, outmoded, I've heard this a lot, technology is taking over our jobs, um, our jobs are being eliminated because they can be done by students, um, no offense to students, um, uh, I think it's a class issue, they can be done by uh, automation, things like that. And if you hear that conversation go on and you live in that reality, it's very hard to think about how you build a system where there's in an inclusive approach to things. And I think that that's the challenge that we face here in an institution where, um, where rank is always very important. Do you have a PhD? Are you tenured? Are you not tenured? Are you an adjunct faculty? What department are you in? What are the rankings of the school? All of those issues really play out. And so then if you have a whole support system in place that is uh, invisible in a lot of ways, uh, you see, I think the institution starts crumbling if you don't really recognize what's going on. So um, I think that there's a systemic challenge to that. I think that part of that comes from um, an approach at a, again, systemic level that the administration and multiple administrations have a, an anti-union perspective, whether it's articulated that way or not. Um, the, the nice thing about being in a union is that we can force the university to, to actually negotiate issues. They can't just set policy and impose them, which is what happens for other employee groups. They have to negotiate with us. Now, we may have power or lack of power in that situation, but um, they have to have a conversation where they don't really have to have a conversation in a lot of other situations. So, th so there's been a perspective there um, by multiple administrations to ensure that other employee groups don't unionize, right? Faculty in particular, uh, grad students, um, civil service, p and haven't had those efforts really in a long time, but there's that perspective that's there and th those things all layer in. Um, to the approach that happens. So, um, and as a result of that, we see things where um, the unionized staff don't participate in the same levels of governance discussions that every other employee group participates in. So you have the Senate, which includes faculty, civil service, P&A staff, but not bargaining unit staff, not AFSCME represented, not Teamster represented staff. So you have this whole conversation that exists here, but not over here. Um, you see things happen, um, decisions, and I'll just talk about a couple of decisions and then where common interest comes in. You see the administration make decisions uh, like canceling staff appreciation day in order to um, save on administrative costs. Well, what message does that send to staff if the one day a year that you have for appreciating staff has been canceled in order to save administrative costs, the year after they spend $2.8 million on retirement bonuses for senior administrators, right? Where do the priorities come in? Where are the class decisions that are made there? Um, I'll just give one other example. Two days ago, two days ago we sat in a discussion in um, the Humphrey School where someone from employee, from uh, human Resources talked about the new employee engagement uh, program that's in place and talked about how all employee groups were engaged, um, being consulted about this new polling process, and um, how in February all employee governance structures were going to be um, consulted with how things needed to change, what decisions were being made, etc. Well, that didn't include all employees. It included the faculty, staff, the faculty and staff senates, which do not include unionized employees. Nowhere in his presentation did he talk about discussions with unions or with unionized employees. So there's, again, this whole system where there's a, 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 an invisible workforce that is kind of disregarded and discounted. And that's, that's the reality that a lot of people face. But I think there, uh, and I'll, uh, 
I can get into a lot more of this later. I also have a tendency to talk on and on and on. Um, those who know me know that well. Um, but I'm going to talk about what are the common interests that we have and should have and how do we build, uh, uh, looking at that reality, how do we really build inclusive uh, community. And I think we have to start from the land-grant mission and the students. Um, as staff, as faculty at the university, I think it's really important that we think about um, what the student experience is here. And um, within that, we have to think about the fact that your reality determines your consciousness, right? So what you see is going to impact how you think about things and how you feel about things. And it does, in a world that revolves around ideas, like the academy, um, I think that gets lost at times. So what do students see when they come in? They see that the vast majority of people of color who work at the university are in maintenance positions. They're the janitors, the grounds crew, and the food service staff. Um, the vast majority of clerical employees are women. The vast majority of working class people at the university are in the lowest paid jobs. So you look at those issues, you don't see, certainly there are people of color on faculty and in higher paid positions, but it's much more limited. So if you're a student of color, if you're a working class student, and all you see um, in terms of a reality that's reflected are the lowest paid workers at the university and that those workers are discounted, how does that reflect on whether or not you will feel welcome at this institution, right? So that's, a, that's something that we have to think about and that the institution has to think about because we're here to, we're here to ensure that students have a successful experience because they're the ones who are going to change the world. Um, I think we have to ref, uh, have work to reflect a, a system where all work has dignity, where people have the ability to have careers without moving up the ladder, um, that you can, you can live out your job as a clerical worker the rest of your career, and that's okay. Doesn't mean that we're incompetent, just means that we may have other things we're doing with our life, um, that, and we're working here for different reasons, not to move up. It might just be for the health insurance. Um, you know, I hear that from a lot of people. They would do something else if they had health care. Um, so I want to just say that these, these questions are challenging not only for the university, but I think for all organizations. So within our union, for example, we have some of these conversations too. Like how do we, how do we reflect uh, participation in leadership that, that works for all of our members, for all clerical workers? Um, we took a position recently um, where uh, we sent out we sent out an email to people um, encouraging them to attend a rally um, uh, in support of Trayvon Martin and his family um, uh, after the verdict, the George Zimmerman verdict came down. I tell you, I was shocked at how many horrible, horrible comments we got back from people who wondered why we were taking a position on it, felt that it was irrelevant. This is not a workers issue. This is not a union issue. Even though Martin Luther King died, was assassinated supporting a, a garbage workers strike of AFSCME members in, um, in Memphis. If it's not a workers issue, then what kind of issue is it? We're not a white union. Um, we're, we're a union of all workers. So those are challenges that have to be dealt with within organizations as well. So it's not just the university, it's kind of as a whole. Um, but I think if we have a perspective of solidarity, we can actually get through these issues and really find where the commonalities are if we're willing to ask the difficult questions and challenge ourselves. And in Minnesota, we don't always want to challenge ourselves on having the difficult conversation out loud with anyone other than our family over the Thanksgiving table. So I'll end with that. Thanks, Shereen. So our final um, panelist is Michael Goh. Uh, Michael is Associate Professor of Comparative and International Development Education in the Department of Organizational Leadership, Policy, and Development in the College of Education and Human Development. Um, his personal and professional life is and has been an international and multicultural journey. I'll just leave it at that, and maybe he'll talk about some of it, and or you can read about it that journey. Um, his teaching, research, and service are focused on discovering better ways to conceptualize, assess, and ultimately teach multicultural and intercultural skills for and to students, counselors, and educators. Um, and we actually intersected a number of years ago in the Multicultural Fellows, Teaching and Learning Fellows program when he was 
already working on those issues, already had been working on those issues, and came together with a group of other faculty to, to talk more about those and work on those issues. He works across age groups and in multiple communities here and internationally, helping to improve access to mental health services for ethnically diverse new immigrant and international populations in the United States and abroad. So I've asked him to talk about through his work with those diverse communities and, and teaching diverse communities and teaching about multicultural and diverse issues both at the university and elsewhere. What do you want to tell us about better fostering justice, diversity, inclusion at the university? Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation to be here and thank you all for spending time this afternoon to listen to our stories. I, I truly feel like if you take anything away from today, it's about understanding that uh, the four of us and the many of us in the room experience the university very, very differently. We see it differently, we perceive it differently, and we experience uh, both celebrations and discriminations in, in all forms and colors. So my international background is important. Uh, for those of you who might uh, know about Singapore, um, tiny little island, uh, uh, collectivistic, but uh, hierarchically collectivistic, if you will, it's sometimes described as a socialist democracy. I don't know if those two can exist, but they do. <laughs> and um, so I come as a, uh, for those of you who know Singapore, kind of rule-abiding, uh, socially conforming uh, person, uh, first as an international student in Bloomington, Indiana in 1986. Uh, and then arrived in Minnesota for my PhD in 1990. So from that perspective, uh, I bring also uh, a cultural uh, international lens with regards to how do you do inclusion, since Singapore is uh, almost, uh, gently speaking, uh, dictatorially multicultural. <laughs> so so multiculturalism has, has a different form in, is an, in the word I use, enforcement if you will, um, engineered uh, in, in, in a tiny island. <clears throat> so I was uh, in Singapore, uh, returned to Singapore after I received my PhD from the University of Minnesota to give back, if you will, to my community. Um, I share that because when I tried to return uh, back to the University of Minnesota, um, I was convinced uh, after experiencing academia for, for uh, three and a half years that I am truly a clinician at heart. So I'm a counseling psychologist by training um, and, and wanted to get back into practice, if you will. <clears throat> Spoke to uh, many of my mentors. In fact, 19 out of 20 of my mentors said, yes, um, we agree. You know, we were your supervisors of your clinical work uh, at the University of California, and we agree that this would be a good move. One person, and happened to be the last person that I met, was director of... Uh, the Eco Opportunity Program and Affirmative Action and, and basically said to me, Michael, what the hell are you thinking? You know, <laughs> he's been at the university for 45 years and he's seen inclusion and exclusion. He's seen power and privilege. And he said, you have the rare opportunity um, to be in that position as a person I know who may not abuse power or privilege. Um, you've got to be crazy to give up academia. And you hear from my bio, I, I listen to that one <laughs> minority voice. Um, but I came and I pursued a tenure track assistant professor position. I felt no power or privilege. <laughs> um, and, and I wanted to maybe respond uh, with some of my comments to some of the, the points uh, my, my distinguished colleagues uh, raised. And, and so forth, when you talk about health um, and wanting healthy community. As a, as a junior faculty on tenure track, I was stressed. <laughs> and and so, so where's the power? Where's the privilege? Uh, but certainly hierarchies, expectations, norms. Um, and I'm a mental health professional worker myself. And, and yet, you know, my wife will tell me pre-tenure, I was a different creature. Uh, my insurance person will tell you that pre-tenure, I had four fender benders that could not really be explained. Um, and it's because as a faculty member, you know, the public perhaps sees us as having an easy life, autonomy. You are forever thinking about, about publications, productivity, what else can you put on the front burner, what grants can you apply for. So 
that that can feel very disabling <laughs> in some regards. But but it's not as I'm, I'm not here to tell you a soft story. I'm telling you a perspective, sharing a perspective of what it's like to be a junior faculty. There are other expectations as a junior faculty of color. Um, naturally, uh, there, there are assumptions made about your research agenda that that tends to make assumptions that your research agenda is is for people of color or for communities of color. Uh, for me, it happened to be so. Um, but but I, I began to notice uh, that assumption that, that you are the expert, you are the voice, and therefore you must be on all these committees uh, mm -hmm. because we need a face. Um, one that I took seriously is when students saw me as a face for something, and I had to explore and investigate and understand what that additional responsibility and burden meant for me. And I took that one very, very seriously um, to the extent that... Uh, well, let me put it this way. To the extent that even if I did not, I was unsuccessful at tenure, those relationships, those roles, I almost took more seriously than my career. Um, it was also interesting, I think, as a junior faculty, uh, as you know, being it, uh, suggested is a, is a light word, a way you should publish, how you should publish, and what audiences. And um, I found a way to, I think, com compromise. So this is not to say I did not agree uh, with my supervisors and my mentors, but, but I found a way to reconcile places that I felt uh, I wanted my products to be read, to be disseminated, which were not necessarily the, the higher profile, uh, prestigely ranked uh, department enhancing <laughs> places. Uh, but I certainly, and maybe this is a Singapore thing, I nodded my head and I said, yes, I'll do it. And indeed I did it. But I also published in the places where I felt the community uh, would be impacted and, and where change might be more practical than intellectual and theor theoretical. And I came to that, that uh, compromise because I felt that even if I did not get tenure, I wanted to be satisfied. <laughs> with my effort, I wanted it to be meaningful and purposeful that I, I, I made an impact. Cause, and, and that's a broader discussion that I won't belabor at this point, but it, it made me question who my stakeholders were. Um, when Lola then talked about safe and unsafe spaces, faculty feel vulnerable <laughs> as well. Um, and maybe back to health again, I feel very stressful today uh, because... Uh, there's a camera on me, uh, and, and, and the title is about changing a century-year-old <laughs> institution. And I wonder what my colleagues are thinking about what I mean about what change, what's wrong with the way we're doing things, if any, um, and, and, and whether that's safe to talk about. So I, I, I feel that even today around this, this topic. Uh, there's no time-delayed censorship, and God forbid you're archiving it. Oh, dear. It's, it's here forever. So I have to be careful. <laughs> so, and this is post-tenure, all right? Um, because maybe I would like to still be promoted to a full professor. But So we think about these things. It's our reality. Uh, we wonder. Uh, I think we have this culture of feeling, um, maybe up to a certain point, I don't feel I'm at that place yet, where... You're forever being evaluated. Uh, someone's judging you about what you say and your opinion and your ideology. So, so it's, it's there. And, and I don't know if we can feel better or do, do better in that uh, regard. Okay. Um, moving on maybe to Shireen. Um, and I'm really sorry because I, I feel like there is still a great deal amount of incivility in the way uh, staff are being treated, talked to, um, and, 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 and excluded. Um, and I want to shout out to Carla Hill. Carla Hill worked uh, in educational psychology for, I don't know, more than 50 years. And, and, and her reach is around the world because uh, it's not the faculty that they will name as, as the person who helped them graduate, uh, PhDs especially. It's Carla Hill. And Carla Hill was the administrative uh, supervisor in our office. Um, Tina, I don't know her last name, I'm sorry, uh, was our custodian in Burton Hall. For many years, and I eventually brought her into my career classroom. I don't know if you met Tina uh, as a guest speaker in our classroom. And, I, and we played this game that some of you are old enough to remember, what's my line? <laughs> and the more they asked Tina questions, the more they could not imagine that she was the, the custodial supervisor in our building because she's a, 
She's from Romania. She's a certified public accountant. And, and, and my future career counselors in the classroom would try to counsel her out of this job. That, and, and she has such satisfaction in the work that she does. She has formed such relationships with students uh, in the building. And, and she makes a lot more money than I do <laughs> because of her seniority uh, and tenure that she would not give it up because it helps her send the money back home to help her family. So, so those stories and perspectives are important. And, and I'm glad I'm in a college of education, and I'm sure some of you have, have stories in your college too that are positive. But the College of Education and Human Development and our dean is a strong leader, leader in, I think, including um, representatives. Uh, within committees, within a strategic task force. Uh, so those, those efforts are important, but I will admit uh, there are many of my colleagues who are not happy <laughs> with that. Um, and there are perpetual questions of why do we need that voice? Uh, why is that voice important? Because it's messy. <laughs> that, that kind of work is messy. So those are some initial comments that I, I, I bring and, and look forward to interacting with uh, the conversation here. Thanks, Michael. So um, we've taken more than our allotted one-third of the time here. So I, I want to open the conversation to all of you, but let me just say a couple of very quick things as I do that. I, I, was, I was making notes about sort of commonalities and themes, and as I thought that might be useful to help it will name them. Uh, I don't know that it'll frame the, the, the conversation. You're welcome to go off in whatever directions you want as you make comments or ask questions. But and Michael started off by he he summarized one piece that I saw um, repeated through some of the comments. We experience the university differently depending upon where we are. Shireen said your reality determines your consciousness, different ways of saying it. Um, but a couple of other things I I saw repeated or that seemed worth emphasizing, and I'm, I think I'm going to try to do these in a, in a positive way rather than a critical way, sort of what, what could we be moving towards given the comments from these multiple perspectives. Um, one is about um, challenging titles and power differentials. They exist. We, we can't, I mean, Ferd talked about, about leveling it. Well, we, 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 could, we could have that as an ideal that may not actually be the right answer, and all, but but there are different ways of doing, at least challenging them and thinking about them and realizing that they're there and thinking about whether they ought to be um, followed or how to overcome them or what the implications those have for the way people are uh, interacting. Um, uh, one repeated several times was about, talked about differently, awareness, um, being intentional, um, just paying attention. It's about the status piece, but but being attent being attentive to these issues as they play out in front of us um, in the workplace and in our individual work as well. Broadening our sense of what matters um, to not just our narrow piece of the world of what we're the decision we have to make, the task we have to do, but but realizing it's almost. I mean, it's in some ways putting yourself in the shoes of others, but really just re realizing that much more matters than the very narrow piece in front of us. Um, and, and then finally, um, taking risks. Uh, a number, uh, and, and that again I think appeared in a number of the comments, individually taking risks, needing others to, to notice that when people do that and affirm those who have stepped out, we can't all be brave all the time, but we can maybe help those who are. Um, and also recognizing the risks that exist and the risks that others face and why they may or may not be doing what you would like them to do because of those risks and then just recognizing. And it, and it recognizes the risks to ourselves as well. So it, it just opens up the the interaction and the conversation, I think, to, to think about those aspects of our interrelationships and our roles here and not as, as a way of helping to not focus on titles and, and structured roles, but, but focus on, on broader things. So those are just a few of the things that, I, that occurred to me as sort of repeated and broader themes that were coming out of it. But I want to open it now to you. Um, you are welcome to ask questions directed at individuals, directed at the whole panel, um, comments about your own experience, how 
you know, why are you here? <laughs> why are you in this room? What brought you here from your own experience? Um, what did you want to learn that you didn't? What did you learn that you're happy to learn? What, um, what do you want to teach us? So. <laughs> and as Anne said at the beginning, we'll pass a microphone around. If you feel comfortable identifying yourself and where you're from in the university, that, that would be great. But uh, it's not a requirement, and um, you are not being filmed. The picture's still on us, but y you'll be heard. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Roblewski. I'm from the College of Biological Sciences. And one of the, I want to just add to Carol's list of themes, because I heard the word vulnerability. Maybe the word wasn't said in some of your presentations, but um, the, there's, a, there's a vulnerable aspect to every role and status, you know, from student, class, the faculty who doesn't have tenure, even those who have tenure have their own vulnerabilities. Um, so I was just struck by that. You know, it's just it's kind of moving to me that uh, risk happens around vulnerability and how we feel about our own vulnerability. So it's just a comment. And, and I think we always see, we see our own, and we don't always see those who are in a different place, either, quote, below or above in the terms of hierarchy, or different, different, different positions. Uh, good afternoon. I, first of all, I want to thank uh, all four of you for sharing your perspectives with us today. I think it's very courageous to really engage in these conversations and um, I just want to share that I am an alum of the University of Minnesota, and I'm also currently working at another institution of higher ed, and my name is Shoyi Ying. Um, and I just want to say that I think for me, uh, working with students specifically for the last several years, I have found that when we work in an institution of higher ed, we are intellectually understanding these issues. We all are on the same page. But I think when personally we're looking at it, that's a different story. And so until, um, until staff, faculty, and students understand that it is a very personal commitment, it's going to be very difficult. Um, and I think we talk about it. Everyone knows what language to use when we talk about these issues. They know what to say to make sure everybody feels inclu included in the conversations. But I think um, there's still certain things we don't actually practice in our personal lives that really reflect the commitment we have. So for me, I, I just want people to think about that as they head out of this room, but think about, you know, in your personal life, what are you committed to doing? And um, are you practicing what you preach here, wherever you are on, at the campus? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, hello, thank you all so much for what you shared. Um, I'm Teddy Potter. I um, am Director of Inclusivity and Diversity for the School of Nursing. And one of the things we're looking at right now is the um, topic of rankism um, and how it impacts us. So on your beautiful comment that it starts with the individual person, that's where we're at in the school right now is looking at um, the issue of rankism and how we might unwittingly participate in the perpetuation of that. And ultimately, when rankism is is the norm in healthcare, the the ultimate loser is, is the people seeking healthcare. They end up on the very bottom of the ranked hierarchy, and our outcomes, our good wishes and desires for positive outcomes, are not able to be met. So I loved what you said. It starts with us in the school of nursing. We've got alumni, we've got staff, we've got people with administrative positions, we've got faculty here today to really look at this as a school of how can we move to a health in a healthier direction as a society and so Michael can I insert a comment uh, and, and I appreciate the the, the chat so far I'll just speak out and I don't have sense I don't know that is that on go closer <laughs> no, nothing. I don't know what I was going to say. 
ಅಷ್ಟೇನ ಐ ಡೋಂಟ್ ನೋ ದಟ್ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಡೂ ಅ ವೇ ವಿತ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಬೌನರ್ಬಿಲಿಟಿ ಮೇಬಿ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಇಂಡಿವಿಜುವಲ್ ಪರ್ಸನಲ್ ಕ್ಯಾರೆಕ್ಟರಿಸ್ಟಿಕ್ ಐ ಡೋಂಟ್ ನೋ ದಟ್ ಇನ್ ಅವರ್ ಲೈಫ್ ಟೈಮ್ ವಿ ಕ್ಯಾನ್ ಡೀಲ್ ವಿತ್ ರ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಇಸ್ ಅಮ್ ಅಸ್ ವೆಲ್ ಸೋ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ದ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾಪ್ ಇಸ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ವಾಟ್ ಹ್ಯಾಸ್ ಹೆಲ್ಪ್ ಮೈ ಪ್ರೋಸೆಸ್ ಇಸ್ people people in authority people with power creating spaces where we can have conversations where we can listen and talk and share and and my question here is despite vulnerability or in spite of rankism can we be authentic in the way we present ourselves our, our struggles our challenges and and i i i must say i found um spaces um carol uh was instrumental in in her role with the Bush Early Career Teaching Program and and then the Multicultural Fellowship. So so I've I've managed to find spaces like that and resources on campus, the Office of Equity and Diversity for sure, and then my own professional spaces. Um I haven't always found that in every department. I I found a really good one in my current department. Um and in those spaces I feel like authenticity is encouraged in spite of our vulnerability. no i'm uh, aditi i'm a phd student in the comparative and international development education uh, department um and uh, thank you all for your uh, thoughts uh, on uh, diversity one of the uh, reasons why i came in because uh, i mean i'm an international student and uh, uh in i was part of this uh, in the in my program we are part of this co- we have this cohort system where we uh are belong to a cohort and it was interesting because when we talking about rankism the cohort i think the cohort was created to uh, for as a support system for phd students but it's interesting as i see the dynamics within different cohorts that it sort of sets a, a stage about who is moving ahead who's moving faster in the phd program and who is lagging behind it sort of sets uh, although that's not very uh, spoken of and um, and uh, so so when uh, so even even the cohort which has very few uh, students in it, it, it it's important to uh, think about how we can uh, make that a community and uh help uh, you know support each other no matter what stage everybody is in and that itself is uh, challenge it just doesn't automatically become like that um i guess just on this conversation about ranks and rankism and um how that sets up really unfair power dynamics going back to the who's university campaign that was one thing we talked about a lot was rankings um you know and like metrics and how is the u of m and like different departments um how do they disenfranchise students of color or students that maybe don't fit the profile you know like don't meet that certain gpa don't um have you know that certain track record that institutions that have this kind of strategic plan or whatever trying to be this you know internationally renowned university blah 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 you know top tier third top 3 whatever it is um how that disenfranchises students who bring something else to the table um who whether that is you know their perspectives their lived experience or you know things that can't necessarily be measured and aren't always included on that list of things to look for and um you know i know of a lot of people for example who have maybe considered applying to like the dental school or the law school or whatever and put themselves down because you know they say I don't even meet the basic requirements and they're not going to believe in me why should I apply and so I think that not only does this disenfranchise you know students of color but I think it's also disenfranchising the U of M itself because if you as an institution are not you know going out of your way to invest in these students and invest in these really bright minds and if you're only looking at metrics I mean it's kind of like the institution is shooting itself in the foot um and so I think personally I think that this obsession with rankings is not helpful um i mean that's my bias i understand that it's a lot more than that it's about competition and being competitive and blah 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 um but i know that uh for me as a student of color myself who didn't always fit 
the metrics, who didn't always fit that profile, if I hadn't had professors and mentors on this campus who didn't invest in me despite me not meeting some of those things, I wouldn't be where I am today, you know? So going back to your comment, I really think it is about people making that commitment to say, okay, this is, this is kind of what the system wants me to do, but I also have a personal commitment, and I'm going to invest in these faculty of color or invest in these students of color and help them meet their goals. The only thing I was going to add on a couple points that were made, one is one of the things we've gone through is if you're going to try and create a safe environment and people feel comfortable to be vulnerable, the leadership has to go first. If you're not willing to be vulnerable and open up, how in the world is your staff going to do that when there's this power differential? And so that's one, been one key thing that we've worked on. Um, I was the first director of Boeing to do, in essence, have my staff evaluate me. How, if I'm here to help you be successful, how good a job am I doing? What's working, what's not working? And share that and talk about that and be open to that. And my directors are doing the same thing with their teams, including a director who was really struggling with the team, felt that this was the wrong person in the role, really upset, and open herself up to them and say, help me work on this. What's working, what's not working? Be vulnerable first so that, that people feel comfortable with that is critical. The other thing on rank, um, it is... I don't want to be naive about it, and we're continuing to struggle with sometimes the challenges around power differential and rank and title and, and getting past that, but we, we work very purposefully trying to address that. We've had interdisciplinary retreats, strategic planning retreats, where we er, everyone part of Boeing and it helps contribute to the success of our operation, from the people taking care of the facility up to through my office. And so we have our medical services had retreats with providers, nurses, Frontline staff, receptionists, appointment makers, they're unionized, civil service, P&A, and we purposefully combine them at the tables at the retreat so it's not all the providers sitting off at one table and have them working together on how do, what are we trying to address, what are the challenges, how do we improve it. Decisions made affect everyone. It's the flow of the patient and the, and the data through that and that everyone at each table felt comfortable to engage in the discussion, that it's not just... The, the directors and the providers that are dominating the conversation, it, it was everyone contributing to it. The other thing we looked at in that setting was almost as a role-playing exercise to have someone raise a controversial point, have me really shoot them down, and the room got real quiet. And then we stepped back and said, someone needs to speak up. <laughs> I want people to be comfortable to call each other on, wait a minute, I thought we were supportive and respectful of each other, that was out of line, you're pulling rank, and people feel this was just an exercise, I want people to be comfortable with this, to recognize when we're not, we're going to make mistakes at time. When we do that, feel comfortable to speak up and call each other, hold each other accountable as we work toward this together. So those are some things we're doing, trying to address. These are ongoing challenges, but it's things we're working to try and how do we translate this into operations to address these issues. I I want to just add one comment before I know there's one person with the microphone and someone else. This notion of safe space from a classroom perspective. Um, a number of years ago, I was part of a meeting, law professors talking about bringing issues of gender, race, class, sexual orientation, all those things into our classrooms. And, and we were talking about creating safe space for doing that. And there was a student present, not from the University of Minnesota. This was in Washington, D.C., and there was some, some one of the schools there. And she said, you can't make it safe for us. You don't know, you know, as a faculty member in the classroom. I, I mean, I mean the, the, the kinds of things you're talking about is about making it safer and creating an environment which allows that. But, and again, speaking from the classroom perspective, I don't know what's happening outside student to student. I don't know the comments that are going now. Of course, it can be social media as well as comments in the hallways as well as... The, uh, uh, you know, they may be playing bingo on the, you know, the way, but, but what, but it's, and, and that, that was, I, I remember that all these years because it, it changes my thinking about how, you know, I, I have to work at it, I have to invite, I have to, but I have to recognize, I can't push, and I can't make it safe, completely safe, and I can't therefore expect students to do I mean, I need to take responsibility for some of that conversation. But even then, I, it's not always safe for me either. It's not safe in meetings, faculty meetings. 
but so we all have that. And so recognizing, I just thought that it would be part of it. We can try to make it safer, but it's, it, we, we don't know the universe that, that our colleagues, our, the, the other staff, other faculty, people in different positions, and our students are in. And so we just have to recognize that's the part, the risk piece and the recognizing it and just realizing it's not completely safe. Um, hey, everyone. Can you guys hear me? Um, my name is Jordan. I'm from the Humphrey School. I'm studying um, a master's in development practice. I want to ask a question which you guys thought about um, religious inclusion and exclusion. And I kind of come from, I come from the position as a Christian. And when I, I started my program recently, but I kind of see a lot of, uh, just like, a lot of the assumptions, the visions for human good, the visions for human flourishing, sort of um, true understandings of truth that I come to the table with, they're kind of, they're I, I, similar to sort of what I hear from, I think, Lola. So what I hear from you, they're, they're like, they're kind of underneath, like the normal discourse, you know? They're more seconded. You can't bring them out as fully to the table. Even the language that people use within the context. Um, and so I think in some sense, in Western history, it's constructed to oppose Christian discourse, you know? So I'm wondering what any of you guys would think about that about, like, what does it mean to also include, like, religious inclusion exclusion, especially for kind of traditionalist communities in which um, the, our society is kind of, has, they think they've moved past that. Also, because I think, I think every, I kind of come from a place where every, no position is neutral, you know? Every position is relying on certain underlying assumptions which are not universally available to all. So, yeah. What do you guys, like, what would that mean to include r religious include religious groups, especially whatever, traditionalist or whatever you guys want to say? I don't know. Yeah, I guess I can try to speak to that. Um, so I am a practicing Muslim, and um, I wear the hijab or, you know, the headscarf. And so I think that that definitely is a marker, you know, when you're walking um, on campus. I think people pretty much can identify that, for me at least. Um, and I would say that, I guess, you know, it is a really difficult question just because the U of M is a public institution, right? And so there's this tension, and I think OED had a critical conversation about this last year, but there's this tension between, you know, want, you know, you do have an obligation to allow people to practice their faith and express that, like freedom of religious expression and belief, um, but then at the same time, where do you draw the line between what is a secular space and what isn't in a public, you know, in a public space? And so um, from my personal experience when I was a student um, as a Muslim, I felt like, um, I felt like for me there were spaces where I could be my whole self. Um, for example, in Kaufman on the second floor, the cultural centers exist, you know, and so for us, you know, we had Almadino Cultural Center, which is primarily a cultural center, um, but it has a space for prayer for Muslim students, and I think if, if we hadn't had that, the five years that I spent at the U would have been very difficult, you know, um, because there really is no other space on campus to pray, there's, there's no mosque or anything, and there were times when I remember I would pray like in the corners, you know, on hall in hallways, on the grass outside, and you kind of just do what you got to do. Um, and so, in those spaces, I felt safe, you know. Um, but in other spaces, sometimes not so much. Like I remember one time, um, I was wearing like a longer flowing skirt, like to my ankle, and I was walking down Frat Row. And I remember, like, some of the guys, I don't know, they may have been drunk, I'm not sure, but started yelling slurs at me. And I couldn't even hear what they were yelling, but I just knew they were yelling something at me. And it made me feel very uncomfortable. Like, I felt afraid, you know, and I started running because I didn't like that situation. Um, and so I don't, know, it's, it's, I don't know if I'm really answering your question, but I think, generally speaking, my experience has been that Religion isn't always included in conversations in the classroom. Um, when we talk about diversity, I think race comes up, sexual orientation comes up, gender and class come up, but religion rarely comes up. Um, and I do agree with you that there does seem to be a collective kind of, um, I don't know what the word, I'm not diminishing, but kind of just like neglecting religion and forgetting that religion and spirituality do like play a large role and impact in personal development, student development. And so um, I agree that there need, definitely needs to be more of a push to include religion in that conversation, all religions, um, yeah.
Sorry, I don't know if I answered your question, but... I'm going to try to not answer your question, too. No, <laughs> I think... I... I think, ideally, in my mind, if, if any space, the, the university, universities in general, are supposed to be the, the ideal space to explore epistemology, to argue about relativism, etc., so it should be uh, the perfect space. If, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there was a study done, and University of Minnesota seems to fall into that, that space of generally being stereotyped, some people say correctly stereotyped, as having some liberal orientation, whether it's political or whether it's religious. And I find myself, the responsibility I give myself, particularly in the training of mental health professionals and teachers now, is that most of the students I get in these two programs do come with a certain orientation that is more, for lack of a better word, liberal <laughs> and accepting. And I, I feel like it's my responsibility as an instructor to give them, offer them cases where uh, there, uh, there will be religious affiliations, spiritualities, values that will flip their quote-unquote tolerance, if you will. And I think those are realities both in mental health practice and, and especially in teaching. So teaching right now, you know the many contentions. Uh, I use the word anoka. <laughs> I think many of you will understand that I think are very difficult intersections that if we don't give our students the opportunity to wrestle and debate and disagree in the classroom, they will also fail similarly out there. And I don't know if this is appropriate, but heck, I've, I've lost, I've risked enough. <laughs> but I feel like uh, Pope Francis's comments recently are an interesting move in the right direction. That's my value <laughs> in, in how we should be having these conversations. Well, I know there are like could I, more comments at least. So could, did you have could I respond to that as well? Is that is yeah, it already? Yeah. Um, this I say less from uh, my perspective as a staff person at the university and more from my uh, previous uh, life, which is that I think there's an incredible model of liberation theology experience in Latin America in particular. I can speak to having traveled to Central America, not to other other areas, so I'll, I'll just be particular to that, um, that I think is pretty amazing that sees this vision of social justice that comes at it out of a, out of a religious belief. And I think one of the challenges um, in the U.S. is that a lot of times the way that religion gets framed, um, regardless of which uh, religious belief you may come from, it's always viewed as a very conservative, anti-justice uh, perspective, and I think that I may disagree with people on what that definition of justice is, but I think that people who do bring a religious belief to it um, care very deeply about what their um, what the issues are that they're working towards, and I think that there could be much more of a dialogue about that, and, and we may differ on how we define justice, um, but I think that, that we have to have the space for that, not just view uh, religion as a monolithic um, conservative uh, force as well. And, you know, that's my take on it. Go ahead. Hi. Is this on? Yes. Well, I have a lot of feelings about religion. It's very significant to me, but I actually wanted to go back to your point about um, setting up a safe environment and comment on your comment about that. And you know, in my most humble space, I would say, you know, I don't know you and you don't know me. And I might look like something that you think you know, and you might look like something that I think I know. But you don't know what's safe to me. And the fact that you think that you can provide safety for your staff I think is what the problem is, and I think that people don't get real answers for a number of reasons when they create a situation when somebody who's in power over your job asks you to say something. So I think, I mean, it's a question I'm looking at in my research is, would I ever get any correct answers if I interview people and ask them questions because when you're dealing with people's vulnerabilities and like Michael Goh was saying 
and you nod yes because you don't want to be the different person, I, I would just challenge you to think that anything that people said at that meeting would be true. I really appreciate the comments, and, and, and I, I would agree with that. The one generic response I would have to that is I, I feel like I don't have all the answers, and I know what here's what I'm going to do, and boy, look at the great outcome we've had. One of the things we're doing in all of our initiatives are, and again, maybe we don't get the honest answer, but we're trying to talk to the, the, our teams and our stakeholders, what does SAFE look like to you? What, what could we be doing to improve that? Are we, are we making progress? Do you feel safer that it's feedback from the team itself and, and their sense of is this working? And again, maybe people don't feel comfortable that they're saying, oh, yeah, sure, new director, you're doing a great job. It's getting better. And, and how do we get at that, um, that that's maybe some of that challenge also. But we're trying to do that and not just we've got the answer, let's impose a system, here's an exercise, and we're now safer, um, really trying to tap into the people we're, I'm serving and trying to support with them helping us understand, are we getting to where we need to? Are we making progress? So trying in that way, and yet if there's challenges to that, how do we overcome some of that is, is really critical. Um, we're doing that in other areas too with students and, and services, and we're here for our students. What, what do you want us to do rather than us saying we know what's best for you and imposing programs and services and so forth. Um, and the other, the other five-second comment I'll make is that as we create a caring community of well-being, spiritual health is a critical piece of that. If you don't have that as a component, you're missing a, a very important aspect. So uh, Cody Nielsen on campus is a colleague that working very closely with, but that, that is, I would agree, that's a critical piece around spiritual health, religious affiliation and so forth. So we are running almost up against the end of our time. There's at least one person, who, two people. Very quick comments, and I won't let the panel respond. We'll just have to leave them as one. Oh, well, um, I, I would like just a little bit of a response, because the one thing we haven't really talked about was um, this, oh, I'm Jody, I'm the Diversity Outreach Librarian. Um, and, uh, you know, we have the, the one topic about rankism is the New York Times article about calling out the University of Minnesota for having sort of a bloated administrative um, system. And so now we have this co co consultants coming in and kind of like looking at our job families and saying, <clears throat> can we just change um, the way that we like identify the different job families? Yeah, can we not just, can we just not call them administrators? Can we call them something else? And I'm really curious if that's, I mean, that seems very like a, we, you've talked a lot about um, authenticity. That doesn't seem like a very authentic way of making a change. Um, and I wonder if there is something that would be more um, beneficial. Like, I haven't, I haven't heard anyone talk about, like, what would be an alternative to having a discussion that would actually be more authentic in this. So I think despite the fact that, you, I, I, we're not ending the conversation. Actually, that, that would be my final comment anyway. We're ending the streaming, the formal part of the program, but clearly all of these conversations, but this one in particular because it relates to how we interact going forward, this is the beginning, not the ending of the conversation. So I would invite people to stay if you want to and hear a response and continue to, to talk about this. And actually the last thing I'd say is I, I invite you also to leave here and think about and maybe talk to somebody else because saying it makes it so more than thinking it. What what will you do different the rest of today and tomorrow? Just small, that you know, thinking about this and applying it and then maybe it's the next day after that. It's because it's small steps as well as continuing the conversation. So with that, I thank, ending the formal program, thank you all for coming and um, thanks to the panelists for the ideas that they have brought to us. Thank you.